Happy Wednesday, everybody. We are back after taking last session off just to kind of take a little break and get ready to dive into the world of software-defined access. And that's exactly what we're going to be doing today, as well as the next several sessions, possibly looking at maybe four or even five sessions just on software-defined access, because as you can imagine, there's a lot to cover as far as SD access is concerned. So as far as today is concerned, we're going to be first of all looking at what the big deal is about the software-defined networks. And in order to do that, we need to start with the problems of what our traditional networks give us. And so we're going to take a look at what, you know, what we do from a traditional networking perspective and then why SDN, how does SDN, just software-defined networking in general, let alone Cisco's SDA platform, but just how does SDN solve problems? I mean, if we can't solve any problems with SDN, then why are we deploying SDN all over the place? Uh, after that, we're going to be talking about, you know, now now we're going to be <laughs> drilling into SDA itself and all of the specifics around, you know, what makes a campus fabric versus a software-defined access fabric, and then diving into the specifics of the different, uh, the arch well, I guess, first of all, the architecture of SDA, and then also the different layers and the different components of an SDA solution. So for those who are new to this uh, experience, I suppose, <laughs> uh, welcome to the Encore study group. What we're doing is we're just walking through each and every week, uh, looking at different blueprint items from the Encore, uh, I guess the list of topics from Cisco. So if you're studying for a CCNP route switch, or I guess they call it enterprise networking now, but if you're studying for that CCNP, then the Encore exam, uh, enterprise networking core is what that stands for. The Encore exam is going to be a required part of your journey. And so uh, this session has been pre-recorded. You are welcome to chime into the chat and ask questions. I am here right now live answering questions available in case you have anything. So if it involves software-defined access, then of course ask those questions as you have them. If you're studying a different topic in Encore, then be sure to chime into the chat and ask those questions as well because we're all here to help. And so if it's not me, maybe somebody else can chime in and help, but either way, we're gonna try to do our best to support each other as we're going after the CCNP certification. All right. So without further ado, let's go ahead and dive in. I think we are good to go here. I'm excited. I've got a new camera and the camera's not going to turn off every 30 minutes. So <laughs> uh, that's very exciting. For those who have seen some of my previous videos, the camera just decides to shut off after 30 minutes. It's a wonderful thing. So first of all, we need to, again, explore the the pain point. You know, I, I was a I call it a pre-sales engineer for a long time with a Cisco partner. And one thing that we had to learn, and I had to learn early on in my career, is if you can't solve someone's problems, they're not going to be interested in the solutions that you have, right? I mean, we've all heard that phrase, a solution looking for a problem, <laughs> somebody trying to convince you that you need something. And if in, in your heart, you don't feel like they're going to do anything to make your life better, or more enjoyable, or fix a problem, then Oh, none of us are going to be interested in that. We've all endured sales pitches, whether for a career or just wandering down a shopping district or something like that, or maybe a mall, you know, someone's trying to sell you something. It's like, I'm just not interested. I don't believe in my heart that I need that. So if we're going to believe in our hearts that we need software-defined networking and we need software-defined access, then we need to start with what are these problems that we're going to solve. So let's talk about traditional networking. So in the world of, again, traditional networking, sounds really weird to say, you know, the way I used to network is now traditional, but yeah, it is what it is. I'll, <laughs> I'm getting old enough now where a lot of the things that I used to do growing up is considered retro by the kids these days. So I guess that's representative of the age, right? But when it comes to traditional networking, think about the way we build a campus network. Okay, think about if you've taken any Cisco courses or you have... Uh, you know, studied for any Cisco exams, they're probably going to walk you through this concept of a campus architecture. And the way that campus architecture is arranged is we typically have some kind of core, network core. We're going to attach those two switches together, for example. And then we're going to have a distribution layer. And that distribution layer here, right over here, core layer. Then we have a distribution layer. And we're going to interconnect all of this. This is all going to be layer three. We're going to connect these together at layer three in some way. And then we are going to extend this down to the access layer. Now, the access layer is a bit unique. Up until now, we've had only two switches in each, um, call it a, a module. You know, we talk about the modular network architecture, right? So, um, but, but really, at this point, we're talking about them as if they're layers. So we have the core layer, the distribution layer. And so when we look at that distribution layer, we're extending down to access closets. We could have dozens of these access closets. And each access closet could have multiple access switches within those closets. And so when we look at our actual real life scenarios, 
a lot of us have probably worked on networks. Maybe you're managing a network today that has this type of architecture built out. And so I know when I worked for a medical clinic, for example, uh, we had... Oh, I'm trying to remember. I think it was in the like the 16 closet range in one of our buildings. So every single one of these closets had a pair at least of 4,500 Cisco switches, access layer switches. And so uh, we have as many of these access closets as needed in order to extend Ethernet out to everybody. And so uh, things may, you know, things have changed over the years as we've adopted wireless. We need less wired connections, but ultimately, in the vast majority of cases, we still have access layer closets that are out there. And so one of the questions that we have to ask ourselves when we are building an architecture like this is well, how is this going to operate from a subnetting perspective? How are we going to deploy our clients out there? Um, one of the traditional networking concepts is that if I create a subnet, that subnet is going to belong to a broadcast domain. And we know that broadcasting is bad in networking because Ethernet is kind of a terrible protocol, but it's what we built the entire foundation of our society on at this point. As integral as Internet is to everything we do, Ethernet can't handle broadcasting very well. And so when it, you know, that'd be one thing to say, well, okay, let's just not broadcast, except all of our clients are constantly broadcasting for a lot of different services, not the least of which is DHCP, among other things. And so given how much broadcast traffic is being created by our end devices, we need to contain these broadcast domains because if we get up to, you know, we can maybe handle 256 or, or maybe even 512 devices on a single broadcast domain, but when we get beyond that, it really starts to impact us because our PCs are all handling thousands of broadcast messages per second, and uh, they just can't handle that on some level. And so we want to reduce the broadcast domains, and that's great, except we also need to have some of our clients within the same broadcast domain because we leverage services that are built on relying and re receiving broadcasting. Um, DHCP, we know that we can use helper addresses and we don't rely on a PC being in the same subnet as a DHCP server, like maybe 30 years ago it did. But we, we do have other services that are going to want to reach out and find each other over broadcast, you know, some Windows services and printing services and such. And so we do like to keep our clients on the same subnet, but we want to shrink these subnets down and so we, we find ourselves in this design conundrum of how big are we going to make these broadcast domains. Now, um, one thing that further exacerbates this problem is, is the idea of wireless. Because now we have to worry about connecting from one wireless access point, And I'm roaming, I'm walking down the hall, and then all of a sudden I connect to a different wireless access point. Well, if this wireless access point and this wireless access point are on two different subnets, then that can create a problem. And because now I have to do a layer three roam, my IP address has to change. Or we have to get into some sophisticated, fancy, you know, anchor tunneling mechanisms. And at this point, the, even this concept of wireless roaming is a little bit archaic because with the advent of wireless LAN controllers and again, these, these anchor tenants and things like that, we just, we've got these uh, ways of dealing with this scenario, but it still was a problem that we had to overcome. And so really what this boils down to is we need to decide, let me change colors here. We have to decide at this point right here, these connections between distribution and access layer, are those going to be layer two or are they going to be layer three? Okay. If they are layer two, then we can have total control over this scenario. We can decide how large to make each broadcast domain. We can decide how small to make each broadcast domain. We can make sure that everybody is able to communicate with each other across broad, you know, within the same broadcast domain if possible. In other words, if a PC is attached to this switch here on the closet here on the left, and it needs to talk to a PC over here on the right via broadcast messages, well, we can make that happen. We can place them both into, for example, VLAN 100 on all sides, and because these are layer two connections going up to the distribution layer, uh, you know, VLAN 100 can essentially be extended as one uh, large broadcast domain, I suppose, at least physically it's spread out across multiple access layer closets. That's the good news of layer two. The bad news of layer two is a three letter word <laughs> that we, uh, we all like to hate on, and for good reason, it's spanning tree protocol. 
Uh, spanning tree is a very difficult protocol to um, contain at scale. It's one thing if we just have a few switches and a few closets and so, et such, or, et cetera. But when we've got a large enterprise campus, spanning tree can become a big deal. And so even when we're running rapid spanning tree or multi-instance spanning tree, uh, it just it becomes problematic. You know, some Cisco switches, some people aren't even aware of this. You might have a Cisco switch that can support 4,096 VLANs. Well, that's all the VLANs, by the way. <laughs> but if you look at the data sheet, it can only support somewhere in the vicinity of, I don't know, 128 or maybe 256 spanning tree instances. And we know that with Cisco spanning tree per VLAN spanning tree, we need an instance per VLAN. And so as soon as you know, we think that we've got support for all 4,096 VLANs, but as soon as we make that 129th VLAN on the switch or 257th, depending on the switch model, as soon as I make that one plus one VLAN, it can't put a spanning tree instance to that VLAN, which means we're not running spanning tree on that VLAN, which basically means the network's going to go down, right? <laughs> because we love to loop our networks for redundancy. And it just doesn't work if we're going to not run spanning tree on a VLAN. So we become very limited by this at scale. Um, it, we, we can just have problems, you know, uh, spanning compatibility problems. I know that I've told the story possibly even in this, uh, in the study group. I can't remember for sure. I've told the story so many times, but the, the very short version of the story is I went to plug in an access layer switch, very innocuous operation, just plugging a switch into the distribution layer switch during working hours. And uh, because the distribution layer switch was running non-rapid spanning tree and the switch that I was plugging in was running rapid, it didn't, it failed to negotiate. And because it failed to negotiate, it formed a loop and it took down the entire um, organization, <laughs> at least that that uh, branch that I was at. And uh, yeah, that wasn't a fun conversation to have with anybody. And I, as a network engineer, I can all day say, look, the technology should have worked. And literally to fix it, all I did was go back and do the exact same thing. And that time it worked. <laughs> um, so it sort of justified that what I did was not the wrong thing to do, but it also just sort of created yet another part of a culture that said, well, everything we, if we're going to touch anything on the network, it has to be done after hours. Well, okay, yes, we as network engineers, we're all expect, not only expected to, but we're willing to put in time after hours. We understand that there are sensitive um, or keeping the network online should at least be a priority uh, and that we want to be sensitive to that need. But if you create a culture of everything has to be done after hours, then, well, now now you've got network engineers who are putting in way more time a week than what is healthy. And so uh, spanning tree is just one of the contributing causes to that because not just my example, but just in general, spanning tree causes a lot of issues. When spanning tree hiccups, people lose network connection and people do not like to lose network connection in this day and age. Um, on top of all of this, by the way, oh, wait, wait, we weren't done with the conversation. All right, so what if we went with a layer three solution? Say, okay, well, Jeff, let's just get rid of spanning tree altogether, which is true, we can. Um, I like to use dots to represent layer three connections. So I'm just gonna throw some dots on here and say, look, what if we just converted all of these connections over to layer three? Does that solve our problem? Well, it certainly solves the spanning tree problem. We no longer need spanning tree at all in this environment because we don't have broadcast domains. But keep this part in mind over here. Uh, if we do layer three to the edge, it does force us to have small broadcast domains. And so that actually is a good thing. Uh, at least it helps us contain them. But we are no longer in control of that. Because for example, this scenario here where I need a client on VLAN 100 here and a client on VLAN 100 over here, that's a scenario that cannot happen when we have layer three to the edge. Now, in a lot of situations in the modern network, we, we have less and less need for this on a campus infrastructure. In a data center, layer two is everything. Like we have to control layer two inside a data center. But out on the edge, I mean, how often are PCs really talking to each other on broadcast? How often are we really relying on broadcast for printers and scanners and such? Uh, fax machines, anybody? <laughs> so there, there are... There are always things that will be out there, but it is a scary proposition as a network architect to design a solution that you know cannot support something in the future. Even if today you ran all of, you did your due diligence, you ran all the tests, you, you proved we're not using any broadcast services. So we flip the switch over to layer three and we're running layer three. Life is good other than 
now a new application gets installed. And now we need those layer two connections. And it's like, oh, we just went through all this work. We just went through all this effort to convert our network over to layer three. And now we have to convert it all back. And I've been part of those migrations, by the way. There was one specifically I remember where I had to tell, again, I was a consultant, so we were working with another company and I had to tell them like, look, it was the right decision to put layer three in this network. And this was specifically between two locations at the time. And like, we didn't have the need at the time, but now, now you have the need for layer two. And so we're gonna have to extend this, convert this link to layer two and extend broadcast traffic across it. And so we had to go through a conversion process in order to essentially undo that which we had done intelligently, right? Like we're trying to fix problems here. And so we deployed layer three, and but now we have to go back to layer two. So neither of these choices are great. Uh, layer two is certainly the safest from a, just making sure everything works all the time perspective, or I shouldn't say it like that. Uh, layer two is the safest from the perspective of making sure that all of our services that we need are able to be provided, right? Regardless of what application we deploy, we can definitely support it on layer two. Layer three is safer from once it's up and running, it's going to be robust because we are running OSPF or we are running EIGRP and OSPF and EIGRP are both worlds better than spanning tree protocol. And so the fact that we can get rid of spanning tree is huge, but now we're running the risk of just having to convert back as soon as one application gets installed that requires it. So that is our conundrum in the traditional networking space. Now, beyond that, we also have to worry about um, this nasty concept of configuration management. So I am, again, a traditional networking engineer. I've been around for a while at this point. And so I'm very comfortable at the CLI and imagine a lot of you who are watching this, a lot of you are very comfortable with CLI commands and logging into a switch and making sure you can, you know, config T and do everything you need to configure a switch or a router to sing and dance for you. Uh, but we have to zoom out and look at it from a, call it an IT director level uh, per view. Because yes, as technicians, as the people who are on the front lines configuring these switches. Yes, I love the ability to log into each individual switch and configure it and make it do all the whiz bang feature features and give me everything that I need at my fingertips. Whatever I want it to do, it will do. But here's 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 the problem. It's really easy for me to go to a whiteboard and define a policy. And what do I mean by policy? I mean like a security policy or a QoS policy something that's just like, this is how we are going to do this from now on. And, you know, IT director level type of conversation, maybe talking with network architects and saying, okay, we need these two subnets to never be able to talk to each other, right? It's really easy to say that on a whiteboard. VLAN 100 should never be able to talk to VLAN 101, okay? How easy is it for us to take that policy and convert it into configuration? I would put it at a moderate to hard level of difficulty. I mean, for those of us who have had experience with configuring access control lists and for crying out loud, the QoS settings that are completely different on every single Cisco platform they've ever made, whether it's, uh, you know, back in the days of uh, multi-layer QoS or, um, uh, of course, we've got, um, boy, MQC, right? Module QoS, CLI. And so we've got all kinds of different ways of configuring QoS. And so if we just want to say, hey, voice and video traffic take priority on our network. It's really easy to say that on a whiteboard. It's really easy to decide those kinds of policies. I don't wanna say easy, I, I don't wanna minimalize that. It actually can be very complex to create proper policies. But at the same time, that decision-making process is usually not what is preventing us from deploying more strict security and QoS policies in the network. What's preventing us from doing that is this part right here. And again, I'm not gonna say that it's impossible to go out and deploy a policy, but what really can be the nail in the coffin for deploying a policy that should be, you know, that should be deployed can be the maintenance of that over time. Because how many of us can say with absolute certainty that our access list, every access list that's out on the network is 100% clean, right? Like no extra statements, access control entries are all good. Um, it's blocking everything that it should. Uh, there, 
of course not, right? Like we we all as network engineers understand that no, once you put an access control entry into an access control list, you never touch that. <laughs> you know, I mean, it might be referencing a server that was decommissioned 20 years ago, but like just in case, I mean, it's not doing any harm, right? It's just I'm not going to I'm not going to remove an access control entry because I mean, that might just break everything and and I'm not going to be the one responsible for breaking anything. I mean, I've been there. It's hard. It's really hard to go back and clean up configurations, whether it's access control list or something else, because, you know, hey, well, maybe I want to know that that configuration was in there at one time. Or maybe maybe if I do remove that, like, what if I'm wrong? What if that configuration is needed? And and so the, re the reward of cleaning things up seems small compared to the risk of cleaning up something that should not have been cleaned up. And so maintaining this policy over time I mean, I'll, I'll liken it to a beautifully cabled network closet. I mean, we've probably all seen this. You deploy a brand new network closet. The, the cabling is beautiful, immaculate. It's tied cable ties, cable trays. Everything is, is just so great. It looks amazing. And then what happens? Within a year, you go into that network closet and somebody just strung a cable from two, you know, from a network or a switch port to a, a network jack. It's like, and we all just want to completely flip out, but that's the reality. I mean, it's, it's all, it's science, right? It's entropy, this concept that everything works towards chaos. We have to put effort into maintaining order. And so there's no difference between a network closet cabling and policy from that perspective. So we can have, we can put all the time in the world into this policy and then we can spend a bunch of time configuring it and then we have to spend a bunch of time maintaining it. And then guess what happens also? We get something, some kind of new application or something that is going to affect our policy. So now this application or whatever this new need is shows up in our policy and says, uh, or I'm sorry, shows up in our network and we look at our policy and say, oh, the policy needs to change. So we push that policy down to the implementation team and of course, we're the ones on the implementation team oftentimes. And so we get that and we're like, oh my goodness, you know, I've got to, I've got to go out and spend, I don't know, 20, 40, a hundred hours, whatever it's going to be pushing this policy out to the rest of my network. Okay. Now I know a lot of network engineers, you're, you're from all walks of life and all different types of organizations. If you have a small network, none of this is going to be particularly alarming. Uh, you're going to look at you, your probably your core or maybe even have a collapsed core. So really you're looking at collapsed core and distribution switch. You've got two or three access lists on there. Not a big deal, right? I mean, policy changes, you're, you're going to roll with those and you're going to get them up and running. But as you scale this out and you think about a campus environment like, like a Cisco, for example, or like a, a remote user type of scenario. I mean, we live in a remote world right now where everybody's VPNing in. And you say pushing policy out to all these remote places, VPN policies. I mean, it, it, it gets out of hand very, very quickly. And so that's the takeaway here that I want to really make. Um, the last thing, too, in all of this is what are we binding our security and our policy, our security in QoS to? Um, I mentioned access control lists. Where do we apply access control lists? Layer 3 interfaces. Wh which layer 3 interfaces? usually switch virtual interfaces or VLAN interfaces. Okay, so if if I have a policy that says VLAN 100 can't talk to VLAN 101, I mean, that's the most granular I can get for them, generally speaking. In other words, I can't say, hey, Jeff's PC, even though he's part of VLAN 100, he, he, he works in IT, he really needs access to those resources in VLAN 101. So Jeff's PC should have access to those resources. Uh, and so what do we do? Well, usually what happens is we put our IT staff into a separate VLAN that has special permissions. But if, you know, I don't know, Bob from accounting comes in and plugs his computer into my network jack and gets a VLAN 110 IP address, well, now Bob from accounting has access to all of the resources that I had access to because the policies are not applied to this guy or even my machine. They're bound to an IP address range. And that's true for QoS as well in a lot of cases. We're just going to mark our traffic based on the subnet that it's coming from. And so it's just an archaic way of doing things. You know, we have the tools in place to say when Jeff Kish logs in to the network, 
we're going to treat him in such and such a way. And maybe Jeff is the exception and, and everybody else in the subnet gets access to those resources, but we know Jeff's a troublemaker. So we're not going to let Jeff have access to those resources. Uh, whatever our policy is, it should be on a per, really a per user basis, as opposed to a per, you know, even, even the machine argument, you could say, well, you know, if somebody gets access to Jeff's machine and logs into it, well, now he's on Jeff's machine and, and they can still have access to all of Jeff's stuff. Um, well, then, that, then that's a security breach in and of itself. So, you know, take that for what it's worth. But um, you think about people logging into servers and this and that. So there's a lot of different situations where you could tie it to a user, but at least to a machine and not to an IP address. Because it shouldn't matter whether I, as, as me, if I'm logging into VLAN 100 or logging into VLAN 110, either way, I should have the exact same policy enforcement about whether I can access resources in VLAN 101. So hopefully that makes sense there as well. Okay, so it has only been almost half of our time and we've covered the first component of this. So we'll see how far we get today. <laughs> um, we'll see how far we get. And if we have to split this up into two sessions, then uh, we can certainly do that. But if you, again, I'll, I'll call this back out. If you have any questions or thoughts about any of this, uh, any like, hey, Jeff, why is that such a big deal or, or et cetera? Just you know, free for to chime into the chat. I imagine in a lot of these cases, I'm preaching to the choir. A lot of us have the experience enough to know that this is problematic. And boy, you know, I wish we had a solution for this. All right. So let's talk about a solution for this. What are we going to do? What is, well, I was going to say, what is Cisco to do? But really, what's the whole industry going to do? Okay, well, what the industry is going to do is they're going to create a solution called Software Defined Networking, SDN. Um, I often joke that if, you know, if, if to you SDN stands for still don't know, because you still don't know what SDN stands for, or not stands for, but what it is, um, then you're not alone. And I wish I could take credit for that joke. I don't remember who I heard it from the first time. But SDN is hard to explain. It's hard to define. I mean, even preparing for this, I was like, well, how am I going to define SDN? Because in a lot of ways, SDN, the definition can depend on the context. Like, what are we trying to accomplish with SDN? And I think that really is what drives the point home is SDN, yes, we understand it stands for software defined networking, but this software defined SD part, it's software defined. It means that I can basically accomplish with it whatever I want because it's software. Hardware is rigid. It, it can um, only do what it was created to do. Um, I, I can't I can't make a um, I don't know. I can't I can't make a I don't know what, what the analogy is going to use on that one doesn't really matter. Um, <laughs> uh, but if I can take two different computers and I can program them to do different things, in other words, apply software to them, then I can actually change the underlying function of what that system is trying to accomplish. Whereas two hardware pieces that were built for different things are probably never going to um, be able to be changed. All right, what am I trying to say really? All right, here's what I'm trying to say. What we're gonna do is we're going to build a software layer to our networking. We're going to abstract, this concept of abstraction can, can sometimes uh, cause confusion as well. So don't stick with me if, if it is. Um, but we're going to abstract our network topology away from our physical underlying topology. What do I mean by this? Here's what I mean. We're going to take this concept of our physical network. Let's say I have five routers and the five routers are physically connected like this. Okay. And let's say that I said, you know what? I, this isn't what I want. What I really want is a network topology that looks like this. I want all five of these routers to be in a star topology. Well, that seems, all right, I guess, I guess that's cool, but that is not at all what we have. <laughs> um, we, we don't have anything like that from a physical perspective. So to be clear, this is the physical, what we call in software defined networking, we call this the underlay. So we have a physical network and then we have a, I mean, honestly, it's usually just called the overlay. I'll call it a, I'll call it a virtual network, but like, don't get locked into that term. Really, this is the overlay and overlay network. Okay. 
Uh, really, I'll, uh, what I should call it, and I'm going to call it, is the logical network. The physical network and a logical network. And so we do have a tool to use in the networking world that helps us to accomplish this. And it's the Swiss Army knife of networking tools. We've talked about this before in the study group. And it is the tunnel because I can connect these two routers directly to each other, logically I can, via a tunnel. So if I build a tunnel that yes, the traffic is going to travel up and then down in order to form that tunnel, but ultimately what I'm doing is I'm creating a tunnel between those two routers. And then I create a tunnel between these two routers and I create a tunnel between these two routers and I create a tunnel between these two routers. There, I have created the overlay, I have created the logical topology that I want out of a physical topology that was nowhere near what I wanted. Just with tunnels. Okay, well that's kind of cool. Um, the other thing in all of this that we need help with is, is all of the policy stuff that we talked about. And so what we need is a controller. Something that is going to leverage intelligence, uh, sophistication, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, but it's going to leverage automation ultimately is what we're going to do to automatically configure this for us. We don't wanna have to, uh, look, we, we could have done software defined networking in 2005 just by manually configuring all the tunnels. Um, if I had come to you in 2005 and told you, hey, this is how you should design your network and you slap me in the face, it would have been a well-deserved slap because who wants to manage all these tunnels? I mean, in this scenario, it's four tunnels. It's not that big of a deal, but in a larger network, it could be hundreds of tunnels. And tunnels are, at least traditionally, they're bad news because I can't get visibility into the tunnels. And if the tunnels were to go down, I could cause recursive, recursive loops and uh, with my routing protocols over them, if the tunnel starts flapping and all these kinds of situations that where, where tunnels were just not a good idea for a long time, at least not as a major foundational component of my network architecture. And so what we really want in this day and age is something to automatically take care of the, um, the busy work. Uh, I don't want my network techs to go out and configure and maintain hundreds of tunnels over time. I want the controller to do that component. And I want that controller, by the way, to remember this concept of defining policy. Well, rather than pol pushing that policy to my implementation team and having them configure and maintain that policy over time, I want to push that policy into the controller and have the controller deploy that out to the network. So we're really combining a bunch of different topics here, a bunch of different concepts in software defined networking. But the idea is to few things with software defined networking. Again, coming back to that, trying to create a definition for it. Really, it's creating a, a an abstracted logical topology that is managed and maintained by a controller rather than by human beings. Okay, that's as close to a definition of software defined networking that I can really give you. I mean, you can go out and Google it and you'll find all kinds of different uh, descriptions of it. Um, you know, there are a lot of references. You'll find a lot of references to when it first started and this concept of open flow. And um, the, a lot of people were really hoping that because this was now going to be my logical network, that this physical network could just be a bunch of cheap, dumb switches. And these could be maybe even white box switches or heaven forbid Dell switches <laughs> and Dell routers. But uh, maybe I shouldn't poke fun at a specific vendor, but in my experience, those are about the bottom of the barrel as far as quality is concerned. And so when you are looking at, at least in the campus space, they make good data center switches. All right, sorry, my <laughs> ragging on Dell is done. <clears throat> Either way, um, when, we, when we looked at software defined networking over the years, the goals have changed. Originally, this was a big part of what they, they being those who were really investing heavily into software-defined infrastructures, this is what they really wanted. They wanted to be able to deploy just cheap, as cheap as possible switches out there that are managed by a controller and all of the intelligence is in the controller. And then that way, hey, it's a commoditized market. I can go out, I could buy a Cisco switch or a Dell switch or an HP switch or whatever piece of hardware I want. And it doesn't matter if this one's Cisco and this one is Dell and this one is HP. I mean, if I did that today, that's going to cause all kinds of problems because you know Cisco can EIGRP and HP can't and Dell's got some of their own protocols and 
It, Cisco runs Pervilance Paint. Really, Cisco's the offender, right? I mean, like HP and Dell, they run all the same stuff. They're using a lot of the same underlying ASIC architecture. But Cisco, of course, is very different. And so this is why, <clears throat> again, I don't know, depending on how long ago you've really been tuning into this concept of SDN, um, I, I remember, I mean, I was reading articles in 2011 timeframe probably, SDN is going to be the death of Cisco. And this was why, because one of the goals of SDN was to make it so that everything we did was buy a controller such that it does not matter what we deploy as our physical network. Because our physical network, again, it's just an underlay. It's all it is. It's all it is. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so that was one of the early goals. Um, uh, certainly another goal of this is this concept of, um, I'll write this out because this is worth it. Um, control and data plane separation. So what does that mean? Well, what this means is when we have a network today, and we're running a Cisco network, we have two routers communicating with one another. What, what does this look like? Well, usually we have a control plane functionality. In other words, those two routers are running EIGRP or OSPF with one another and directly sharing routes and directly sharing LSAs or whatever it is we're doing based on the routing protocol of choice. And then we also have a data plane con concept. And so that would simply be um, <clears throat> uh, the control plane is running and running EIGRP on OSPF and populating a routing table. Well, now that I have a populated routing table out of my control plane, as I get packets in, I check the routing table. The routing table tells me what to do with it, and I send it off. Okay, That's the idea of having a data plane is the data plane just relies on the information that has been uh, provided by the control plane, and I run my own control plane operations. This is the world we are all accustomed to. So when we say we're separating the control and the data plane from one another, I don't know about you, but I start to get panic attacks. And I'm like, well, wait a second. That's like, I don't know, like separating two things that I don't get it. How do you do that? That's like taking a peanut butter and jelly sandwich and saying, okay, well, what we're going to do is we're going to take the peanut butter part away and the jelly part away. Like you're going to have a sticky mess if you do that, right? Well, not really, because what we're talking about is now having devices that are only data plane capable. So you say, okay, well, they're only data plane capable. That means that they have to have a populated routing table. Where are they getting that routing table information? Well, where they're getting it from is the controller. The controller is going to push the control plane information down to these devices. So in a lot of cases, I still have to share routes potentially. I mean, it depends on how much automation is happening here. I mean, in a truly software-defined world, we don't care what subnets are where because all of our policy is based on, like we said earlier, about users and things like that. We've got a long way to go before we kind of address how exactly all of that happens. But the idea is simply that I'm receiving information. Again, think about from a data plane perspective. Do I care as a data plane if my routing table was populated by a local OSPF process or a local EIGRP process or if somebody else gave me routes, all right? So what's interesting about this concept is it's still, if you look out there, if you, if you truly take some time to Google software-defined networking, you're going to see that as part of a lot of definitions. You're gonna see that as a lot of like, this is what SDN is. And this is one thing that Cisco, Cisco kind of turned this on its head a little bit uh, from the perspective of, Cisco values hardware and Cisco values intelligence on the local machine. This is something that's, I would say, probably the biggest influence that Cisco had in the way SDN turned out as of 2020. Because again, in 2011, 2012 timeframe, SDN was going a completely different direction than where we ended up. Um, Cisco said, hey, our switches and our routers, absolutely, everything we talked about so far, controller, yes. Automation, yes. Overlay and underlay here, yes. All of this makes sense and there's a ton of value to it. But to put all of the control plane intelligence into a software controller puts way too much emphasis on that controller. It can cause problems if the controller goes down. And frankly, these devices all have to have some level of intelligence anyways. Let, why wouldn't we use the intelligence that are on that, that's on there? So. In a weird way, we don't separate the control and data plane in Cisco technologies, but at the same time, we, we do because we are going to still run, for example, Lisp as a separate control plane protocol. Um, even though the same devices that are running Lisp are potentially running 
EIGRP or ISIS with the underlay devices. Um, so that's important. But um, what we're going, you know, in ACI, for example, Cisco's application centric infrastructure, um, they, they <laughs> all of the devices are still running both you know, both layers on some level. And so it's just sort of an interesting conversation. The idea of control and data plane separation was truly that you'd have a controller that pushed all control plane information down. With Cisco, there is still some amount of separation, but we do have to pay attention to the fact that um, that hasn't been offloaded to the controller. It might be offloaded to a different network device, for example, a Lisp um, you know, control plane node, essentially, is what we call those. Um, in the software-defined WAN space, we have those vSmarts out there. The vManage, as the controller, is is not pushing this control plane information down. It's, it's you know, running as a vSmart controller, and it's pushing the control plane information down. So that's where we still see the separation, but then we look at the devices themselves, and they're still running some amount of control plane uh, information as well. So, yes, we do still have separation, no, it's not quite what the original SDN framework or the founders of SDN had in mind when they when they went through this exercise. Okay, uh, let's see here. Overlay, underlay, controller, control plane, data plane are separated. Uh, all right, so moving on to what exactly um, Cisco SDA is and sort of where it came from. Has anyone heard of, um, well... I'm going to hang on to this for a minute, but I'm curious though. Go and chime in the chat. Has anybody heard of APIC EM? Does that name ring a bell? Application Policy Infrastructure Controller Dash Enterprise Module. <laughs> this is a mouthful. Um, so we'll, we'll come back to that. I'm just kind of curious. I kind of want to see where, where people are uh, as far as chiming into the chat on that. So before we talk about SDA, we need to talk about a concept called Campus Fabric. The reality is that we're not going to see a ton of campus fabric out in the real world, but you might see a little bit of it. It's essentially software-defined access without the automation components. Okay, we're going to start to see this as a, almost a math equation start to develop here. Okay, campus fabric says this: we are going to use Lisp as our control plane mechanism. And if you're intimidated by Lisp, by the way, um, as as I can promise you that I was when, I, when people start first start talking about it. Like, whoa, 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 what is the service provider protocol that's invading my campus network? <laughs> uh, Lisp is a very cool protocol. Um, we've got, if, if you're a CBT Nugget subscriber, absolutely take the time to go out and watch our videos on Lisp. Um, I've got a, um, I, I actually taught a couple of them. I, it might be the only ones on the site at this point. Um, but either way, a, it's, it's very simple. It's a very simple concept. And we just, once you understand it, it really helps cement SDA you know, fundamentally. So all that to say, don't be intimidated by Lisp. Uh, it's actually pretty, pretty boiled down for us in the campus space. All right, so we're using Lisp at the control plane. We are using VXLAN at the data plane. Okay, so for those who weren't intimidated by Lisp, maybe some of you are intimidated by VXLAN. All right, Lisp, this is pretty cool how this all comes together. Lisp is a service provider technology. VXLAN was a data center technology. Now, I'm a data center guy, so like, I'm like, all right, yeah, I understand VXLAN. Yeah, I'm, I'm good with VXLAN, but Lisp like freaked me out. Um, if you're neither a service provider nor a data center <laughs> engineer, then you're probably freaking out by these the me very mention of these, of these concepts. Um, VXLAN essentially boils down to a layer two tunnel, okay? D just... Just leave it at that, a, a layer two tunnel between layer three capable devices. So, hey, guess what? I can extend a layer two subnet between layer three devices with VXLAN. Hmm, I wonder why I'd wanna use that. Maybe going back to our earlier conversation, right? So, Lisp with the control plane, VXLAN at the data plane, and then we have this concept of Cisco TrustSec. And Cisco TrustSec exists at something Cisco invented. They call it the policy plane. Not gonna lie, I don't think that's an official thing outside of the Cisco space. But essentially what Cisco TrustSec is doing for us is it's managing a security policy tied to identity. And <clears throat> it basically turns the network into a firewall. They call this network as enforcer, or at least they used to. Um, I don't know what the modern vernacular is. Cisco TrustSec is a way of tagging traffic and, and that tag is what determines policy. So remember we said that policy gets enforced on like the switch virtual interfaces. So like when a switch receives it, 
uh, off of VLAN 100. I treat all VLAN 100 traffic the same. I have forced policy against the fact that you're on VLAN 100. Well, I'm going to do the exact same thing with Cisco Trusic, except when me and, and my friend both log into VLAN 100, ICE, which can look at our identity, is going to say, oh, Jeff, we're going to give you a tag of 20. Oh, Jeff's friend, you're, we're going to give you a tag of 25. And it's going to enforce security policy based on the tag itself. So it's no longer looking at my VLAN ID. It's looking at who I am, first of all, getting me a tag. Cisco Trussec uh, is going to use this concept of a, a scalable group tag, SGT. And the scalable group tag on my packet is going to tell the switches how to enforce it. Okay. So again, it, it turns the entire network into an enforcement zone rather than simply the the edge. You know, the whole liken, likening it to like a... Uh, an hard outer shell, like an M&M or something like that, where you've got a hard outer shell and all you have to do is crack the shell and then you got all this gooey chocolate on, on the inside where our networks are the gooey chocolate and the edge is, is like the firewall zone <laughs> and the SVI. So when, a tra when traffic hits that, if it doesn't get dropped at that point, it breaks in, then it's just got full access to the entire network. Uh, we don't want that. We want it to be a jawbreaker, right? Where, where it's just completely solid inside. And this would be... Well, first of all, it'd be a jawbreaker instead of an M&M. But second of all, this would be a Cisco Trussec enforced network where at every single hop, the switch is capable of dropping traffic based on security group tags or scalable group tags. It used to be security group tags and they changed it to scalable group tags because of SDA. And so SGT is, is still SGT, but it stands for something different. Yeah, that's always fun. Okay. So what is Campus Fabric? Well, Campus Fabric is anytime you build a network architecture on these founding principles. So if I build a network manually, and truly you can do this. If I take, uh, remember our drawing earlier, so I've got a couple of distribution switches, okay? And then I've got my access switches, access switch, access switch, access switch. And so if I wanted to say, you know what, I'm going to build a layer three network in here, layer three fabric, and I'm going to build VXLAN tunnels, VX, well, I should do it like down, up. Oh. I should do it down here, VXLAN. So like I build VXLAN tunnels between access layer switches, and then I use Lisp uh, to Lisp. There we go. And I use Lisp to uh, to as the control plane separation. So I'm pushing the policies down or the control plane information down, and I'm using Cisco TrustSec to to enforce policy everywhere. If I do this, this is a campus fabric. I have built a campus fabric, but I can tell you a lot of people aren't too interested in doing this outside of lab environments because, well, what I just say, most of us network engineers are going to freak out about either Lisp or VXLAN or Cisco TrustSec or, hey, potentially all three of those. <laughs> and so we don't see a ton of Cisco fabric or Cisco campus fabrics out there. But still, Cisco has validated designs for this. You can go out and you can, you can build this again, especially in a lab environment and you want to get your hands on some manual Lisp configuration or manual VXLAN configuration, then, then go for it. Um, just keeping in mind that Cisco TrustSec does require the Identity Services Engine or ICE, so you're going to have to have some ICE licensing in order to play with this. But that's great, other than what if, hmm, what if, what if I could deploy all of this using the helpful assistance of a controller? And what if that controller was called DNA center, okay? DNA center as my controller can deploy this fabric, can deploy a campus fabric. If I'm using DNA center and I deploy or use it to deploy and maintain a campus fabric, that is what we call software defined access. So some of you were bizarrely excited about the fact that I promised math equations, here they are, okay? Here, here's the math equations. Campus fabric is equal to Lisp plus VXLAN plus Cisco TrustSec. Meanwhile, software defined access is equal to campus fabric, campus fabric plus DNA center, or you can abbreviate it as DNAC. Okay, there's our math equations. Uh, and, and if you're going to go take the Encore, you're going to take a, well, actually, there is no SDA exam yet, is there? Uh, at least at the time of this recording. So if you're going to take the Encore especially, you need to know those. You need to know those math equations because 
Um, well, first of all, you might get asked about it, but second of all, if you're going to talk to a Cisco rep about potentially deploying this or, or monitoring and managing it, then you're going to need to know your terminology and you know what you're talking about. Ultimately, Software Defined Access is automating the deployment of what would be a fairly complex environment. Okay. Oh, so, um, let me see here. I'm going to make a judgment call. We're going to go into the architecture of Software Defined Access, but uh, there's um, absolutely no way in the world that can possibly cover that in nine, ten minutes. Um, here's what I'll do. All right, I'll give you a quick overview of what we're going to cover, and then we're essentially going to pivot and push a little bit back to next week, and so we'll cover this in more detail as part of next week. So here's here's what we need to know about the SDA architecture. I got so carried away talking about all the ways that our current or traditional networking is terrible. <laughs> like I got a bone to pick or something, I guess. I don't know. Um, SD access architecture. Okay. So the architecture. We, we talked a little bit about it. Um, well, actually, yeah, I'm, I'm going to leave that alone. So... All right, so we talked about the control plane, the data plane, and the policy plane. Okay, those are all good. So we have um, three different planes of operation. Again, this is sort of that terminology thing. We just kind of got to get used to the way Cisco laid this out. Three planes of operation, control plane, data plane, policy plane. Then we have four layers of operation. And no, these aren't like the OSI layers, even though the first layer is physical and the second layer is network. So I don't know. It kind of is, but it's also not. Um Let's walk through these. First of all, we have the physical layer. Okay. Um, the physical layer is is going to, well, for, first of all, we want to like break it down to like what we are actually supporting and what we're not. So in the physical layer, what you're looking at are the components. So the components that we support in an SDA fabric are going to be switches, routers, access points, and wireless LAN controllers. And that's it. Okay, we're not we're not supporting anything else. We're not supporting uh, data center stuff. We're not supporting like UCS and and Hyperflex. We're not supporting firewalls for that matter. Um, we're only supporting switches, routers, access points, and wireless LAN controller. Remember, first and foremost, this is a campus architecture solution. This is not a solution that extends into the data center. That's for ACI. Um, this is not a solution. I'll say it like this. This is not a solution that extends into the wide area network because we have Cisco SD-WAN for that. That said, Cisco is starting to integrate these solutions. I think eventually you're going to find that Cisco's brought SD-WAN under the SD-Access umbrella. I think eventually we're going to see ACI also brought into that umbrella, but it's going to take a lot longer to integrate that solution than it will to integrate SD-WAN, which we're already starting to see. Um, the... Uh, Oh, I, yeah, okay, never mind. I was going to go somewhere somewhere a little bit different, but um, no, no, no. we've got several different roles then that these devices can play. And so our different roles are going to be a fabric edge node. I don't know if I can, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll abbreviate these. So a fabric edge node is one option. We have a fabric border node. We have a fabric control plane node. And we have a fabric wireless LAN controller. Okay, so um, clearly wireless LAN controllers are, are going to always be a, uh, a wireless LAN controller. And technically that would include the access points as well as part of that. So wireless LAN controller slash access points. Um, however, the switches and the routers are going to be either one of these three. It's either going to be an edge node, a border node, or a control plane node. Again, we're going to go into more detail on what this all means and how, how this all operates. But a fabric edge node would be, think of it like your access layer switch. Okay, so in a traditional network, again, think about your network today. If you have an access layer switch and an access layer closet, that would be a fabric edge node in an SDA infrastructure. Um, a fabric border node would be a device that connects to a non software defined access infrastructure. So, for example, if we were connecting to my data center, well, that data center, again, is not going to be running software defined access, and therefore, I'm going to need a border node to sit in front of the data center. 
um, control plane node that's going to come back to Lisp. We need a device that sits out of band to give us all the Lisp information. Okay, so so that's where um, uh, that that's the device that's going to be running the Lisp. Uh, mapping server is the word of map resolve or map server. So that would be a control plane node in an SD access environment. All right. So we need to map essentially the, the components to the roles. And then also, by the way, we need to uh, pay a little bit of attention to the platforms. In other words, a Cisco 9K, Catalyst 9K, we know that Cisco loves those 9Ks and they were basically built for SD access. Uh, but what can a 9200 be? Can a 9200 be a fabric edge node or a border node, or is it only an edge node? And the answer to the question, by the way, is it's only an edge node. Uh, but a 9300, 9400, 9500, they could be any of those. And 9600 can only be a border or control plane node. And so we have to be careful when we're architecting our solution to put platforms in place in, in where they can serve the role that we want them to serve. All right, so that was uh, probably too long of an overview of the physical uh, layer. And then we have the network layer. So the network layer is primarily going to be um, consisting of these three planes. So we, we can import this down here. We already talked about them. Um, and, and also, so I'll talk about the planes, or I'll say that it consists of the planes. It also consists of that concept of overlay and underlay. So we have a lot to cover as far as that is concerned as well. All right, next we have the controller layer. The controller layer basically tells us that we have controllers. Um, there's not a lot to this layer. It's really just understanding that we have, um, first of all, DNA center. Oh, DNA. I can spell DNA. DNA center. Um, that can be a standalone server. It can be clustered into a group of three. But at the time of my recording this, it's physical only. Now, if you do some Google searching, you can find people who have virtualized DNA center. It's out there. You can, um, you know, people like to talk about it. But as far as like officially from Cisco, like supported by Cisco and supported by TAC, uh, the only option is a physical DNA center controller at this point. So um, that it's going to change at some point. I, I can tell you that um, they're already making headway or talking about different options for having a virtualized DNA center controller. But um, that's that's where we stand. I know they're also talking about a hosted DNA center controller. So like you'd subscribe to a service in Cisco's cloud and have that be your DNA center option. But uh, that's where we are there. <clears throat> uh, this is where that APIC EM question was gonna come in. Uh, DNA center actually consists of two subsystems, the network control platform, which is APIC EM, it's just been rebranded. Um, APIC EM was really Cisco's initial foray into software defined networking. They wanted APIC EM to be able to be an open flow controller, but also a specialized Cisco uh, controller. And then they also have the network data platform. This is basically a big data engine that runs inside of DNA Center. And it's a value that Cisco's pushing for a ton of different applications. So they want, um, <clears throat> they want us to be able to run network assurance. That's what this really leads to. Uh, network assurance is looking at all aspects of our network and compiling again big data just taking data from everything and so when we need it we're like hey um, why was this person unable to connect to the wireless yesterday afternoon at 307 p.m um, we can click a few buttons and get a lot of answers for what was happening there and so that, that's this idea of network assurance now obviously that would be a reactive reason to use assurance why did that person or why was that person unable to connect but there's a lot of proactive benefits as well like hey we're gonna have problems down the line if we don't do something about this now okay um, and the last, the last uh, layer is the management layer. The management layer, primarily the emphasis of this is to understand, well, here, I'll write it out like this, um, that we're going to use a GUI to do all the configuration. So again, I hear you, I'm, I'm a CLI guy, I love the CLI, but we've got to get away from this idea that CLI is superior. Um, the reason CLI has always been superior to graphical user interfaces in the past is because in the past, a graphical user interface essentially performed CLI commands underneath the hood. And so I'd go into a graphical user interface and I'd click a button and I'd click submit or, or save or whatever, and it would push those CLI commands. And sometimes it would work. And, and, and if somebody made CLI commands before I clicked that button, then maybe the GUI is going to freak out because it's really just an HTTP interface and has no idea what's going on on this device. It's just going to take the clicks that I do and execute a CLI command on the back end, 
that the, the days of that are, are over. Um, instead, what the GUI is doing is it's running REST APIs, which essentially are a very robust way of doing what I just described um, over HTTP if, uh, as well. And so it's going to um, run those REST APIs against DNA Center, which is down here, I suppose. All right. Now, on top of that, I can skip the GUI altogether and issue the, you know, take advantage of the REST APIs myself. So what does that mean? Well, grab an application like Postman or run some Python scripting, uh, go to Cisco uh, DevNet Zone and uh, just, you know, on, online developer.cisco.com and make sure that you're very comfortable with this concept of REST APIs. Um, if you've yet to go out to developer.cisco.com and, and log into that and start to explore some of the intro, there's a great intro um, tutorial, I guess, for lack of a better word. I mean, it's, it's basically a little training course. Um, if you haven't done that yet <clears throat> and you don't consider yourself well-versed on REST APIs and such, highly recommended, I'm highly recommending that you go out and do that in the next two weeks. All right. So that brings us to the end of our time. Again, my hope was to be able to essentially spend probably five to 10 minutes on each one of these layers. And so we we're gonna to have to push that back into, uh, into next time. But uh, I just want to thank everybody for hanging out. This was a lot of information and I can tell you this is very foundational at this point. Um, I, I, we barely even drew any network diagrams on here. And so, um, this is going to come together a lot better once we um, once we're drawing networks and such. Uh, in fact, the next time we meet, it's going to technically be on uh, fabric operation. We're going to cover what I didn't cover in this session as part of that. But the fabric operation is what is where it's going to come together because you're going to see the packet flow and you're going to see, okay, well, how does this differ from when packets are received by an access layer switch in a traditional network versus how packets are received in an SDA fabric. And I, I just, it, it's a beautiful thing. A uh, software defined access is a beautiful thing. It's very exciting. It's well worth diving into. And a lot of the reason for that is it's just going to be how we do networking moving forward. Slowly but steadily as SD access and generally speaking, software defined networks are going to take over uh, all networks on some level. And so we, as network engineers, we need to be ready for that. And we need to be making sure that we're protecting our business and making sure that our organization is having the best network that we can possibly deploy, but also protecting ourselves and our career. Because I mean, it's so easy to look in hindsight and say, oh man, you know, back in the day, the, the analog voice engineers who, who refused to learn IP telephony, right? Like that was such an awful thing that they didn't, you know, they, they refused to update their skill set. Well, this is the same thing that's happening right in front of our eyes. And so you don't want to be the engineer that in 30 years, 20 years, they're looking back and saying, oh, yeah, those guys who who never actually learned how REST APIs work, like, oh, my goodness, like, how could they have been so blind? Uh, I can promise you that that's going to happen to a significant number of people. And one of the things I care a lot about is making sure that at least those who I can reach are not going to be one of those. So... Anyways, with that, I'm going to hang out in the chat for about five or 10 minutes after this. So feel free to stick around, ask any questions. And um, otherwise, we'll see you next week. When, or I'm sorry, in two weeks, you know, next session, but in two weeks, when we talk about software-defined software access fabric operation. Until then, take care.